WGA Recap Monday. I hope you guys are having a fantastical, magical, wonderful start to your week. I know I am for the most part. I mean, I didn't really sleep well last night, but then again, I never do. I had really weird dreams, but then again, I, I always do. Um, <clears throat> it's cold AF outside. It's like the Arctic tundra. It's snowy and cold and cold, and did I mention cold? Um, I have to go to work today. I have like a few meetings this afternoon. I have to close the store tonight. So it's just like your typical run-of-the-mill Monday. But... <clears throat> It's okay because everybody needs to adult um, at some point or another during the week. And so I'm adulting today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, and then I'm off Thursday. So I won't adult on that day. And then I'll have to adult Friday and Saturday. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's okay. We all have to do it. But we're not here to talk about adulting or to talk about the fact that it's like the Arctic Tundra outside. We are here for GA Recap Monday, where I recap the newest episode of Ghost Adventures, or in this case, Ghost Adventures Aftershocks. And this week, we are reliving two of my favorite episodes, The Stanley Hotel and Penhurst State School, one of which is insanely freaking haunted, the other one which is insanely freaking haunted and insanely freaking sad. So we are going to get started with the one that's insanely freaking haunted, which would be The Stanley Hotel. Now, the Stanley Hotel is one of the most haunted hotels in America and inspired the iconic book written by Stephen King, The Shining, which then inspired the iconic horror movie, The Shining. Um, the guys caught up with a few, Zach caught up with a few people that he interviewed there in the past, one of which was Connor Randall. Now, if you remember, Connor was kind of this blonde-haired, little punky-looking kid who his parents sent to the Stanley Hotel every once in a while following, like, major heart surgeries and stuff. He was a two-time heart transplant recipient. He received his first heart when he was six months old. And his second heart, I think, when he was like 10 or 11. Um, he had a really interesting way of putting it. He's a big advocate for organ donation, obviously, being a recipient of two, not one but two hearts. And he's got a three tattooed on his wrist right here, which I think is an amazing symbol of... Um, his life and the way that he talked about it brought tears to my eyes. Um, he talked about the number three being powerful for him because in his mind he's living for three people, himself and the two others that were kind enough to donate their hearts. Um, he feels a really big connection to the, the people, you know, the person that he has their heart. Um, He's had this heart, I think, since he was, like I said, before he was in his teens. And he just feels a big spiritual connection to someone that he doesn't know or has never met. And he feels that that's maybe the heart donor. Um, and that's just amazing. Like, it makes you really think about that. When you are given someone else's organs, you're given someone else's heart, um, you're given someone else's eyes, you're given someone else's lungs, you think about that person's life and you think about what they went through and you wonder if those memories and those experiences are embedded into their you know we hear about them in being like embedded into their soul um but what about their heart you know and that's something that is such a profound organ in your body you know you ha you have to have your heart to survive you can't live without it and so when and when that heart goes through a lot in its lifetime and then is maybe given to someone else, what, what is that, what does that go with, what goes with it? You know, do the emotions, the memories, and the scars go with it? Or is it new once it's placed into your body and it's now your heart? Um, I think, I think without a doubt it carries in the, in the person that, especially if they're sensitive to their environment, the person who receives that donor heart, um, is going to experience that, that connection. Um, Connor, once, you know, the guys left, he took the, one of the, um, job of resident paranormal investigator. So he lived and worked at the Stanley Hotel as the investigator, um, giving, you know, like five hour haunted tours. And he had several experiences, um, in the hotel while doing those tours. And since the guys have been there, the energy around the hotel has gotten darker. There's this dark figure that seems to kind of be spreading like a bacteria through the through the entire hotel. Um, this is where they caught up with a, a girl named Lisa Nyhart. She is also a paranormal investigator that works at the hotel. And she, relit, she recalled an instance where they were in the concert hall. And they'd set it up like a bad horror movie plot. Like it was two investigators, a priest, and a demonologist. It's like a bad joke. And Zach even said that too. He's like, it's like a bad joke. Um, and it's 
like a bad horror movie plot. Like you've got two paranormal investigators, a demonologist, and a priest. And they're all sitting in a concert hall. Um, and while they were there, she had taken her cell phone and set it down, like in the middle of the floor, and they walked away from it. A few minutes after that, they heard the phone kind of fly. They heard something fall, and they realized it was her phone. It was about three feet from where it was originally placed. The energy started to change. The room got darker. Um, it got a lot more heavy, and she felt this presence on her lap, and she almost got this picture of, like, this giant German shepherd. And Connor was sitting next to her, and he made the comment, I can see it, and it, it's, sn it's snarling at you. I can see its jowls. Oh, hell no. No, 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 no. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for a giant-ass demon dog, okay? No, thank you. I'd be out. Bye, Felicia. I would be gone. Um, and as soon as the demonologist and the priest started using holy water, it, like, ran off and cowered in fear somewhere. Um, but when they left that night, they could hear coyotes howling in the distance in the mountains, which is just odd and creepy, especially after they had the experience with the dog. The next night, Connor went back with two other people, had, had, happened to have a girl sitting next to him, just like he did with Lisa, and the same thing happened. Um, coincidence? Don't think so. Whatever this is, is dark, it's nasty, and it preys on women. Um, and it's, it's evil at best. So, another person who's had some negative experiences, um, is Callie Cheryl. Callie was the lead investigator at the time the guys went to go investigate the Stanley Hotel. Um, she went on a professional ghost hunt with Billy Tolly, who is obviously a member of the GAC full-time now, and she went into a room that there was a death. A guy had committed suicide. She went into the room two days after this happened. Um, she instantly began to feel sick. She began to feel like she shouldn't maybe be in there. Then she went home and this guy followed her home. The spirit of this guy followed her home. And flash forward to this ghost hunt with Billy. And through the spirit box, a voice comes out and says, It's you. I Hey, look, it's you. I found you. And um, then Callie kind of started to shift. Billy said that her personality got really weird. She got really um, quiet and zoned out and distant. And then she started kind of being really vulgar to everybody in the room and they got her out of there she kind of comes out of it in the hotel lobby doesn't really know what's happened but all she knows is that she didn't like it she walked right out of the Stanley Hotel she's never been back um she fully believes that whatever this man whoever this man was he possessed her he took her over and it was not friendly and it's really sad to hear that the that the spirits are getting darker the energy is getting darker it's gonna make it a really hard place for people to stay and it's such an iconic location that I hope for the hotel sake that it it gets better because um the more negative it gets and the more people who are having negative experiences the less likely they're going to want to even subject themselves to that and it could you know that it could be detrimental to the hotel i don't think that's happening i think the stanley is so iconic and so beautiful and amazing and there's so many other good features about it that it's not going to do that but it's always a possibility and it's just really sad and so we hope that that doesn't happen this, the second location that they caught up with was Pennhurst State School. Now, that is in Pennsylvania. And it was a mental facility that locked its doors in 1987 after horrible abuse. These patients were left in cages. They were abused. They were beaten. They were neglected. They were starved. They had their teeth ripped out because they were biting. They, they weren't trying to, like, reform them in any way. They were trying to just basically do away with them. This was when... You know, parents would leave their kids on a doorstep of these facilities because they didn't want to handle them. And they were, you know, inconveniences to society. Um, they had interviewed, this was the episode where they had actually interviewed one of the former residents of Pennhurst. Um, a, a, a woman who looked to appear to have like cerebral palsy or something. Um, and she, but she was vocal and she could talk about, she remembered her accounts at Pennhurst and how they would tie her to the bed and she would have temper tantrums and fits and bang her head against the wall because they weren't listening to her and they weren't helping her. You know, she went to kindergarten at Pennhurst and, and I don't know if she got much education past that. I think that they just kind of gave up on her. And it was really sad to see because I have a daughter with special needs and even though you don't, when you look at her, you don't necessarily know it because she's a high functioning autistic child. Um, she still has challenges and she still has issues and I couldn't imagine for one second leaving my daughter on the doorstep of a place like that and then having her tied up and beaten because she was having a temper tantrum. 
Um, it's just, it's heartbreaking to me. Um, they caught up with D Dr. James Conroy, who is the, he is like, um, he's, he works to like preserve the property and a preservationist, a pr preservationist, I guess. Um, and they, he kind of talked about how, um, the energy has changed a bit just because they had new owners purchase the property and they were trying to revamp it and then the economy crashed and you couldn't do anything with it and so then they turned it into a haunted attraction that kind of became a mockery of the people who live there regardless of whether they want to say it or not or they want to admit that's what they did they did you know they tried to have their own storylines and come up with their own things but it's not like they put ghosts and goblins in here they put patients they made it a mental facility. They had people bang their head against the wall. They had people scream and cry. They had a scene where a dentist was pulling teeth out of people's head. These are all known accounts of things that happened at Pennhurst. Um, and it's just a plain, pure mockery of what happened. And it's really sad. And I think that they can do a haunted attraction there. That's fine. But do it in a way that you give these people dignity and respect. Because at the end of the day, that's how people need to be treated. Um, they sent Mara Severo. She is or Siervo, sorry, I can't tell, read my own writing, Mara Siervo, she was representing the new owners of Pinhurst. She works with them, and she is also a medium, and she was talking about how um, she can connect with all the little kids there, and how she can connect with the doctors, and the people, and the orderlies, and the people that abused them as well, and they hate her, because she will not back down to them. She will not stand down to them. She will, she will fight for these kids, and she has had a crowbar thrown at her head, she has had um, a pressure on her chest. She's been pushed, and it's just because she will not back down to these entities that are dark and evil. Um, and she was, you know, one to say, being the business advocate, that they're not looking to make a mockery of the people at Pennhurst. They're looking to make it a place that um, people can be remembered. And I think, you know, Dr. Conroy mentioned toward the end of the episode that this is on the level of like an Auschwitz Memorial, and it is. Um, this place had so much death and so much degradation that it needs to be built with dignity and respect. It needs to be restored to be a place of mourning, and a place of memorial, a place of remembrance for these people that died there because they died innocent deaths and they died at the hands of some very evil people. And they need to be remembered with dignity and pride. In my opinion, they probably just need to leave it alone. <clears throat> um, kind of like Waverly Hills, don't broke with not, you know, don't fix what's not broken. Yes, the building's broken. Yes, it's unstructurally sound. But at the end of the day, that was someone's home. Regardless of how dark and dank and creepy it was, it was someone's home. And for whatever reason, they have attachments there to it. You start ripping up floorboards and taking away what they know, you're going to make them mad. And they could potentially, like I said with Waverly, unearth something that's really, really harmful and really, really scary. Um, if you're going to do anything with it, just do it with dignity and do it with respect. Because at the end of the day, you're dealing with someone's home. And it's not always okay to mess with that kind of stuff. Um, because you never know what's going to come out of it. So it's going to be really interesting to see what they decide to do with it in the coming months and the, the way that they try to fix it and, and things like that. I know that they're trying to, you know, put roofs on things and put electrical in. And so they're getting to where they want to get, but, um, only time and, and the parent and the haunted attraction is funding that, which I understand as long as, and I'm fine with them doing something like that. I mean, it's the perfect setting as long as they do it with dignity and respect. So it shall be interesting to see how things play out. But that is all I have for GA Recap Monday. I will be back on Wednesday for GAQA What Should I Do Wednesday where I answer all of your ghost adventures and general paranormal related questions. Until then, stay happy, stay healthy, stay warm. It is cold AF outside. Much love and happiness, guys. Bye.